Hey guys, it's Parav, and I'm back on Festive Tech Calendar for 2024. I really enjoyed delivering a session last year. Some of you guys may have seen it. Uh, really excited to be back for 2024. So thank you to Festive Tech Calendar for once again hosting this. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about using Purview eDiscovery to retrieve Teams chats for incident response. Uh, and I'm Parav Desai. I'm a Microsoft Security MVP. A bit more about me. Uh, yeah, I'm a Microsoft Security MVP, as I said. Uh, I'm a Microsoft 365 or Azure Incident Responder in Financial Services. In terms of Microsoft certifications, I have the AZ500, SC400, SC200, and MS500. Uh, I have over five years experience across the whole sort of Microsoft security stack, which includes Purview Compliance, Defender, Azure, and Sentinel. I actively contribute to the community. I'm an author for that eDiscovery in-depth book you can see on the right-hand side. Uh, I was also a technical reviewer for the SC100 book, which you can see, uh, and I'm a speaker. And you can mainly find me on LinkedIn uh, and GitHub, and those two links are there, as well as the QR code. So feel free to pause and scan that, uh, and feel free to connect with me and, and follow my GitHub as well. Okay, so what are we going to cover today? I'm going to be doing a walkthrough of an e-discovery sort of incident response scenario around Teams. I'm then going to show you how to audit that scenario, and then we're going to touch very lightly on the new Purview e-discovery experience, which is currently in preview. It's worth mentioning that today's talk is basically a follow-up from my previous e-discovery talk, which you can see on your screen, and again, there's a QR code, um, because in that one, I really stepped through sort of in a detailed way uh, each stage of the workflow, like literally showing it screenshot by screenshot. So, uh, you know, feel free to watch that first because I will make some assumptions and kind of only show the key differences uh, between that and what I'm doing today from an e-discovery perspective. I'm not going to go through kind of each stage of the workflow in as much detail, um, but the stages that are a bit different I will step through um, so yeah feel free to watch that one if you have already watched that one then crack on if not then pause uh, and please go ahead and watch that one first before you uh, watch this one because this one is like a part two uh, to that talk okay so once again I've structured this like a sort of a, a you know a Microsoft exam the way they give you kind of a background technical details and then a task so the background is that a user sent a suspicious teams message outside of their typical working hours to another user the, the technical details involved is that the message was sent by a user called Adele Vance uh, the message was sent on the Saturday 23rd November 2024 the message was sent to Diego Cicialani and the message contains the word juicy and again I've put all the key sort of details uh, in these kind of uh, boxes, uh, sorry, brackets rather, um, and we'll see why that is uh, later on. Those of you that watched part one, uh, the previous talk, will kind of get an idea as to where I'm going with this, but uh, those that haven't, then uh, you can feel free to follow along. Um, in essence, those are kind of the four pieces of criteria we'll need to find the message of interest, um, but we'll step through that in a minute. Uh, and then the task is basically to use Purview eDiscovery Premium to retrieve the message and gather any additional context if possible. Okay, so firstly, we need to create a case. Um, again, I covered this quite heavily in the previous talk, so I'm just showing the kind of summary page here. Um, the main thing to know here is you need to specify a case name and it needs to be unique across your tenant. Uh, so in this case, I've just chosen Festive Tech Calendar 2024 uh, dash Teams as the case name. Okay, then we need to add our data sources. But before we do that, it's worth paying attention to this from the Microsoft Learn uh, documentation. Uh, and again, the QR code will take you directly to this page. Um, on this page, you'll see that it basically outlines where the sort of uh, Teams related artifacts are stored. So for example, Teams chats, you can see one-to-one -one chats are stored in the Exchange Online mailbox, right? You can see for group chats, they're also stored in the Exchange mailbox. Uh, and even reactions are stored in the mailbox. So all this tells us that we need to be adding the user's mailbox as a custodial data source. Um, and we'll see what we get if it's a group chat, if it's a single chat, uh, and if we get any reactions as well a bit later. Okay, so this is basically me adding uh, Adele Vance as a custodial data source. As you can see, we're choosing her mailbox, um, and we're not applying any holds uh, for this scenario. Okay, so the next stage is to create a collection or a search, uh, and then also review the sort of output of that. Um, so here we're defining our search query, right? So if you guys remember in the 
uh, in part one, we had sort of various conditions about sort of date, sender, recipient, and subject. For Teams messages, it's slightly different. So you do have a date. So if you know when the message was sent, you can apply that date condition. Uh, we know that from the uh, background, if you remember earlier, all the technical details, uh, which was the 23rd of November. So that's why my date range is 23rd of November to 24th of November, um, as you can see here, right? Uh, then you can apply a type condition filter and the type condition you want to apply is instant messages because you know it's a Teams message. Participants is basically anyone present in the Teams chat. So you know that it was sent to Diego. So we've added Diego there as a, um, we've added Diego there, sorry, as a participant. Okay. Um, and then uh, we have keywords as well. So again, we know that the message contains the word juicy. So that's why the juicy word is there as well. Uh, if you guys remember, we can also look at the query kind of conditions in the KQL format or KeyQL, uh, which is keyword query language. Um, and this is just like the codified version basically of the previous screenshot. So you can see the date range. Um, all of this part here uh, is basically just telling you to, to basically reduce uh, the output to just a Teams message. So all of this ipm.note.microsoft, et cetera, all of that uh, is just basically saying, you know, only give me uh, content that is an instant message. Uh, and then you have the participants field, which as we saw earlier is just Diego. Uh, and then finally you have the keywords, uh, which we have is juicy. Okay, so this is the summary screen for the creating the collection. Again, you have to give the collection a name. Uh, I've just given it the name Juicy. Uh, the search criteria is what we basically just saw. Uh, and you can see that this search will be applied to Adele Vance. Um, and this is important because in case you had multiple custodians, you'd want to make sure that the search is performed on the correct custodian. Okay, and then once we run that search, we can see the output, right? So here you can see that one item was estimated. Um, and if we, if we sort of click the uh, view samples button, uh, you'll see that it will show uh, this as an output. So this is basically what the search has brought back, right? And if you look at the right-hand side, it's almost like a preview of the message. So you can see that Adele has sent this to Diego, but what do we see? We see Grady here as well. So now this suggests that this is actually a group chat, and now we've got an additional potential pivot point from our incident response uh, scenario uh, to say Grady could also be a person of interest. Uh, what we can also see at the bottom is the actual message. So you can see, haha, I'm fine, thanks. I found something juicy, which is why this message has come up. But let's wait for Grady to reply. He might be driving back from his son's football game. So it sounds like they're potentially planning something, right? So, so far we've just retrieved the message, but how do we actually get more details into the sort of context of this conversation? You need to commit the collection to what's called a review set. Uh, and then we can also review the review set contents, right? So when you commit the collection to a review set, you need to give it a name. Again, we've given it the name Juicy. One thing that's important here though, is under the retrieval tab, you need to make sure that Teams and Yammer conversations is selected. Reason for that, as it says, is collect up to 12 hours of related conversations when a message, sorry, when a message matches a search. So what that's gonna do now is it's gonna gather sort of 12 hours uh, from that initial message that we saw. Uh, back and forth, back and forth, etc. And then basically it should give us a lot more context into the conversation, which is what we were asked as part of the task, right? Um, so this is the, the output. Uh, so here you can see that one results come back, which is a conversation. Uh, and again, on the right hand side, you don't see even the juicy message, but what you do see is you see that this is the start of the conversation. Hey, both, how are we on this rainy Saturday, right? Doing well, thanks Adele yourself. So this now suggests like this is potentially the previous uh, context behind the message that eventually leads up to Juicy. Uh, so let's carry on exploring. But one thing is that this output is quite small to see, so we can actually make this full screen using this button here. So if we do that, we'll see that this is the image, but again, this image is quite small. So if we click on this, this will open it within uh, photos. Uh, and within photos, I can zoom in here, right? And now we can step through this kind of conversation uh, sort of com uh, message by message. So firstly, we saw the first two messages, so that's fine. Uh, then you see that Adele has replied to say, you know, the juicy message, which is why this is boxed. This is the original message we found. Um, and then, sorry, and then you can, sorry, one sec. Uh, and then you can see the other messages, right? So you can see Diego saying, oh, hopefully he joins, curious about the juice, right? So that's an emoji. Um, then you can see Grady's message, 
uh, when he responds, hey, both good to hear from you. Adela's right got back. Little man scored his first hat trick. Proud dad moment. Spilladel. Uh, and then you see Grady. This is actually a GIF. So this uh, eDiscovery review set would actually render the GIFs. Obviously, this is a static image. But if you were to view this in the portal, uh, you'd actually see the GIF animate as well, which is pretty cool. Uh, then you see Adele saying, drum roll, please. Uh, and then Adele finally sends the image. So it looks like this is what she wanted to share, uh, which looks like to be a meme of some kind. What's your name? Hired, you're hired. And then, you know, Kevin James from King of Queens, if you guys know the reference. Um, but what you also see at the bottom is that you can see the reactions, right? So you can see here that there's a laugh one and a laugh one as well. So they've both basically laugh reacted to this message. Um, so that's also captured here, which is really great. Um, for additional kind of context. Uh, then you can see Adele saying we should use this for the next interview any of us take, which implies that potentially they're looking to leave this organization, right? So maybe you want to consider adding them to some sort of watch list, uh, you know, have a heightened kind of insider threat monitoring, things like that, um, because they could be looking to uh, potentially exfiltrate data or do damage on the organization or anything like that. It's just this message suggests that as a, as a, uh, in terms of the context interpretation, right? Why would people be talking about next interview unless they're looking to leave? Um, so that could be helpful and, and maybe something we want to keep in our back pocket. Uh, then Diego says, that's genius. Grady says, ditto, right? So he's agreeing. Uh, and then Grady says, going to have some lunch and relax. Happy Saturday. Take it easy both. And that's the end of the conversation. Right. So through the review set, we've basically been able to gather a lot more context into the conversation um, and also understand what led up to Juicy, as well as now finding out that potentially these guys are looking to leave the company. OK, so let's get back to the slides. So then once you found that, you can actually export that from the review set because, you know, again, from an incident response or forensics perspective, you would need to have that evidence there as part of your incident report, right? So you can export from the review set. When you export, you need to give an export name. Uh, you can choose what you want to export. You can either do selected, filtered, or all documents as it shows. Um, we're going to leave it with selected, which is the default. And then in terms of output, again, default is condensed directory structure, but you can see the above option, which would put it into potentially a PST uh, or have individual message files as well. Um, once you export it, uh, you basically can, you know, you'll, you'll get a zip. Once you extract the zip uh, and sort of navigate to the native files folder, you'll see this HTML. So this HTML is basically just a, uh, a same version of the image I showed earlier, except it won't be static, right? So, uh, you know, the GIFs and things might animate. Um, they may, they may not. Uh, but the best way to see the GIFs animate and sort of thing is going into the review set. Um, but this HTML is basically just, you know, the, the, the similar to the image that I showed earlier. Um, and if you look, right, the name of the uh, HTML file is quite interesting. It's got item and then sort of a random GUID, right? What does this mean? Right, nothing to no one. But if we go through the review set, you can actually see that this GUID relates to the document ID path of the conversation. So Microsoft's basically saying, hey, this is what you've exported. And that export exported item has this GUID and so therefore the exported file name is going to have the GUID as well so you can kind of uh, match them two together as well. Okay, so after that, we're basically done with the e-discovery in terms of uh, what we do in the portal. So now let's audit everything we've done. And to audit them, what will happen is these six operations will be logged uh, within the sort of uh, what we call e-discovery record type within the unified audit log. So you have case added, custodian created, query created, uh, create working set, export job, and export viewed, right? Most of them are fairly self-explanatory, but we'll step through them uh, sort of one by one as well. So case added, right? And before I go through this uh, table, what I want to stress is that the first three, uh, so let me do the these three, uh, and also the last one, uh, will be present in all the activities that I show, because these are kind of like part of the normal um, schema, right? So you can always find out when something was done, uh, what it was done, like what activity and who did it. Uh, and for e-discovery, all e-discovery activities will have a case ID. Uh, but something that isn't present in all of them is the case field. And if you look, the case name is a case field is actually the name of the case which we gave. Um, and then the case ID is just like the GUID corresponding to the case. Um, so from this event, you can see that at 2028, 20, so late evening, uh, on the 23rd of November, the case has been added or created by Prav uh, with this case name and this case ID. Okay, so custodian created. 
Again, like I said, the first three fields will be common, or well, the first four fields in this case will be common. Uh, but if you look, you get a name field, and the name field is Adele Vance, because if you remember, we added Adele Vance as a custodian. And again, you can see her custodian ID here, which is C182. Uh, if you remember, just C182, keep that at the back of your mind, because we'll come back to that shortly. Uh, but you can also see the email property, which would be her full UPN, uh, but I've redacted it for uh, this scenario. But normally that would be the full email address. Okay, then you have query created. Once again, the same four first columns are the same in everything. But if you look the name, right? So that's the name of the collection. And if you remember, we gave the name of the collection as Juicy. Then you have the query text. Uh, and again, I've redacted the participants, but everything else is basically the same as what we saw earlier, where the date range, uh, you know, type is instant message, participants is Diego, and the keyword is Juicy. But what you can also see is the person ID. And if you remember from just a few minutes ago, C182, right? C182 is Adele, which shows that this search has definitely been done on Adele. So from a forensics perspective, you can be sure that the uh, query has been performed on the correct custodian. And why that's important is because your case may span multiple custodians, uh, and then you wouldn't want to perform the search on the wrong custodian because you could get different results, uh, or equivalently, you could expose more data than you're supposed to see. Um, so it's worth being accurate there as well. Create working set. So create working set um, only has a working set ID and a working set is basically the same as what we did with the review set. It's just in the audit. Uh, for some reason, this is called working set, but you can see C635, right? So if you kind of vaguely remember C635 at the back of your mind, uh, we'll come back to that shortly. Export job. Again, the first four uh, columns are in uh, first four columns are common. Um, but if you look, extended properties name, and that has that C635, which is the working set ID or review set ID, right? So this tells you that uh, the items have been uh, sort of exported uh, uh, from the review set uh, of interest, right? And again, why this is important is because your case may have multiple review sets. So you want to make sure that the, the person doing the e-discovery uh, is exporting it from the correct review set to, uh, you know, uh, ensure accuracy. Uh, and then finally, you can see the extended properties dot value and export options selected, because if you remember, we chose the options to say selected documents from the review set, but you could also have uh, filtered documents or all documents in the review set, right? And if you choose one of those two, then the value would be different. Um, but in our case, we just selected them and, and did the export for selected documents. Okay, so then you have export viewed. Um, so again, first four columns are in common, but the last one uh, basically has that C635, which again shows you that the uh, export has been done from the review set. But now this export viewed is interesting. What this means is that the actual, after the export's been generated, that export's been viewed and therefore most likely downloaded. So now you can basically confirm that the person that did the discovery has actually uh, successfully downloaded the contents that they wanted to export. Because what happens is when you actually generate the export, it will basically get stored in a Azure blob storage on the back end. And then when you do the export viewed, you can basically then download it from that blob to your local device, right? For forensic sort of evidence purposes. So this shows that basically uh, Prav has exported it from the uh, case, from the review set from the case, and also downloaded that export, right? Which then lets you see it on your file explorer, you know, open the HTML like we saw, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Um, now, just before I sort of wrap up, I did want to touch on the new e-discovery experience, which is in preview. Um, this is quite dramatically different to the workflow that I showed in this talk and the previous talk. Uh, but the good news there is that I'm actually working with uh, Ryan and Albert uh, co-authoring this book. Um, and that book will be fully updated for the new experience, uh, which is why I didn't cover it here. So you can go ahead and pre-order that book. Uh, there's a QR code for you to do so. Um, and that book will, will really give you a really solid understanding from three experts in the field um, around the new experience, uh, which is currently in preview. Um, so yeah, look out for that. Um, and as it is currently in preview, you know, feel free to try it in your tenant if you have access. Um, but you know, rest assured that we will um, make sure the book is uh, fully aligning to the new experience uh, once it releases. Okay, so just want to recap. Um, so we did a walkthrough of the e-discovery response scenario, uh, IR scenario, sorry, for Teams. Uh, then I showed you how you can order that scenario in terms of the activities that we performed. Uh, and then just now we touched on the new e-discovery experience, which is in preview, uh, and how the book uh, that I'm co-authoring will help 
uh, for you to learn that and get better at that as well. Uh, and with that, I just want to say thank you to First of Tech Calendar for hosting the uh, event um, and accepting my session. And uh, yeah, hopefully you guys learned something new. Uh, feel free to let me know what you think. Uh, connect with me on LinkedIn and GitHub, like I said at the start. And uh, yeah, I'll see you next time. Thank you for listening. Take care. Bye.